Welcome everyone and thank you for joining today's AWRI webinar. My name is Marty Longbottom and I'm the Manager of Sustainability and Viticulture at the AWRI. In the spirit of reconciliation, the AWRI acknowledges the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and their connections to land, sea and community. We pay our respects to their elders past and present and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples today. I'd also like to acknowledge Wine Australia for providing funding and support for webinars via the AWRI Extension Project. In this session, we'll look at the potential to offset greenhouse gas emissions by sequestering carbon in vineyard soils. Before we jump in and make a start, a couple of quick reminders to anyone who's new to the AWRI webinars. If you'd like to provide a comment or ask a question, please quick click on the Q&A button on the Zoom toolbar, type in your question and click send to send it through. We'll be holding the Q&A session at the end of the presentation, but feel free to send your questions through at any stage. And uh, another quick reminder that this session is being recorded and you'll re uh, receive an, a link to the recording on the AWI's YouTube channel. So for anyone who's just joined, welcome. Today's topic is, can carbon sequestration in vineyard soils offset greenhouse gas emissions? It's a great pleasure to welcome Dr. Sharon Harvey from Wine Australia, Professor Tim Cavagnaro from the University of Adelaide, Professor Robert White from the University of Melbourne and Ollie Madgett from Platt Farm. First up, we're going to hear from Dr. Sharon Harvey. Dr. Sharon Harvey is an R&D program manager at Wine Australia, where she looks after projects in the areas of climate adaptation, climate mitigation, biosecurity and pests and diseases. Sharon's currently working closely with others in the sector to develop a roadmap towards carbon neutrality for Australian wine. Sharon, if you're ready to make a start, I'll hand over to you. Thanks, Marty. Sorry about that. Everything disappeared for a second there. Um, so as Marty said, my job today is to, um, is to set the scene uh, around the, the broader picture of the wine sector in the, um, in the area of emissions reduction and climate adaptation and provide a segue into the um, way more interesting talks that will, that will follow me. So I'll just start sharing my screen. Okay, hopefully you can see that all right. Uh, right, so here are the irrefutable facts. Climate change is real. It is caused by humans burning fossil fuel. Um, and given that wine grapes and, and grapevines are particularly sensitive to the environment around them, we've been already dealing with the effects um, of climate change in our vineyards and wineries for a, a good couple of decades now. So in some ways we're, um, we're ahead of the other uh, agricultural sectors in this area. So what are the consequences of, of climate change? We kind of know all this. I'm gonna whisk through this fairly quickly. Uh, generally, things are gonna be hotter and drier. We've seen changes in rainfall patterns, increased climate variability, particularly season to season, and more frequent climate extremes, which tends to result in increased risk of uh, things like bushfires, which we've seen both in our country and overseas in the last few years. Uh, and the Wine Climate Atlas provides predictions for um, all these and, uh, and other parameters out to um, 2100 for each, um, each wine region in Australia. So what are the consequences for our um, production chain? So again, um, this is all fairly well known and I'll, I'll whiz through it fairly quickly. So as we know, we see um, an impact on our vine productivity and our vine phenology with um, Grapes ripening much earlier than what they used to results in vintage compression, which puts puts um, pressure onto our um, on our winery infrastructure. We see changes in berry composition as the um, development of of sugars and of colours and flavours are affected in the berries, and that then impacts the wine. Um, we'll see start to see changes in pests and disease pressures, which will require different management as the climate changes. Um, and we also start to see um, 
that our, our premium grape growing areas may not be as suitable as once they were for at least the varieties that were grown there. Um, we'll have uh, social license to operate issues, uh, given that we're a, um, we produce a luxury good, how can we compete with other agricultural sectors for dwindling resources in a changing climate? Um, and of course, we're starting to see um, trade restrictions um, where uh, carbon tariffs will affect um, where and how we sell our wine. And it's been well recognised by the international um, wine sector that climate change represents the biggest, uh, the biggest risk to, um, to the global wine industry. Um, but also I'd like to highlight that, um, that this represents some opportunities. So um, premium grape growing areas can expand into different areas. And um, in Australia, we've seen that um, by the expansion into, into Tasmania. Um, also uh, with regard to varieties, 80% of the of winemaking worldwide only uses 1% of the available grapevine diversity. So, you know, the grapevine is our friend. We've got a, a vast array of, of grapevine germplasm out there that, that we can use that'll be adapted to, to certain climates and certain situations. Um, and even trade restrictions represent an opportunity. We say we're clean and green, so um, here's our chance to, uh, to prove it. So there are two responses to, um, to, to climate change and to, to building climate resilience. And there's a lot here, um, but essentially, I just wanted to say that um, on the one hand, we have adaptation, which is um, uh, helping producers to deal with the effects of climate change, uh, adapting to the changes we, we can't avoid. And this is where a main focus of the Australian wine sector has been so far. But now there's, uh, I'm sure we've all detected there's an urgency in the conversation around mitigation. So that is action to reduce the emissions that cause climate change. And that's well, what we're gonna to address today in this webinar. So managing our emissions. Um, so we're all feeling business, regulatory and social pressures to reduce carbon footprints. And this has often been, often been felt most keenly by, by producers. So we've got um, a large range of, of options at our disposal for managing our emissions. Um, and so the steps are that it's important to recognise the business opportunity of being carbon neutral, um, know what your starting point is, what your baseline is in your, um, in your business, understand the opportunities and make a start, even though things might not necessarily um, seem perfect. Um, so what is the carbon footprint of a bottle of wine? So where, this is to identify where the opportunities might lie. So this, this diagram is from a California study, but we've done similar ones here in Australia and, and generally the results are the same. And that is that approximately half the emissions of a, um, embedded in a bottle of wine are to do with the packaging and transport um, side of things rather than the vineyard and the winery. Uh, and there are options there to, to reduce our emissions, certainly. But what we're going to focus on today um, are the, um, the emissions that, are, that emanate from the, from the vineyard. And in particular, we're going to look at um, uh, managing soil. So there's plenty of opportunity here for, here for abatement. And generally speaking, we're a, low, we're a low emitting sector. But as I said, we're under particular threat from, from climate change and um, and as we, as we all understand, we're all under an, an obligation to, to play our role. So how has the wine sector um, responded to these pressures? So we've seen ready adoption of solar energy by wineries. And, and even if we don't recognize it particularly well in Australia, it's, it's well recognized overseas that we're, we're ahead of the game when it comes to this. Uh, individual businesses using sustainable production practices, adopting uh, long-term environmental strategies and striving for carbon neutrality. And there, there's many examples of these. Um, TWE have set, um, set a net zero target for 2030. Uh, Taylor's came out a couple of months ago um, with commitments to emissions reduction. And there's, there's plenty of other uh, examples as well. And of course, we, had, we now have five Australian wine companies that are uh, certified carbon, carbon neutral. Um, we've got our very own um, sustainability program, Sustainable Wine Growing Australia, which launched in um, July 2019 and incorporates the Australian Wine Carbon Calculator. So this is derived from the International 
um, wine carbon calculator. That was the, the first commodity specific carbon calculator developed. So that's a, that's a great as asset for our sector. Uh, in addition, we've set, um, set a goal through Australian Grape and Wines Vision 2050 to have net zero carbon emissions by 2050. And um, I expect that uh, that'll be revised and, and brought forward, particularly following um, the, uh, the Glasgow COP26 next week. So we should be able to get there earlier is what I'm saying. So looking forward then, um, what are we gonna do? So with Australian Grape and Wine, Wine Australia is developing and delivering a roadmap to carbon zero for the wine sector. So this will set, um, set achievable emissions targets, guide the sector towards those targets and provide practical information for producers to, to help them put a foot on the path. Um, we're going to establish a baseline of greenhouse gas emissions so that we know what the starting point is for the sector. And we'll probably do that using the uh, emissions data that's captured within Sustainable Wine Growing Australia. Um, underneath the, the roadmap, we'll set um, a large number of resources and practice change projects to, to assist producers to manage emissions. So we expect that during the development of the roadmap, we might uncover a few uh, gaps in information and activities that we can then enact to see underneath that roadmap. Uh, we've got projects on cover crops, soil carbon and functional di uh, biodiversity to help people manage their, their land in a sustainable fashion. Um, the carbon tool embedded in Sustainable Wine Growing Australia is, is, um, has ongoing review to improve the, the metrics captured by SWA. Um, and certification is going to be reviewed to build more rigour into the emissions data. So that'll be a, a fantastic ongoing resource for emissions data because, you know, if you can't measure it, you, you can't manage it. Um, we've got a number of cross-sectoral initiatives that um, involving other sectors in agriculture. So that helps to, um, to leverage, leverage our funding effectively. And there's a large number of government funding schemes out and about. So our role here is to try and um, try and keep across those and um, and help to leverage the, the maximum benefit for, for our sector. So just coming to the key messages then, we're still going to need to adapt existing vineyards to changes we can't avoid. So even if we stopped emission, all emissions tomorrow, there's still enough inherent CO2 in the system that um, we're going to be dealing with climate change for a number of years to come yet. Um, we can commit to emissions targets as a sector, as I've explained, identify the opportunities uh, for abatement and also for sequestration, which is what we're going to address today. Um, we can use the, the roadmap to guide our progress. And I think it's important to acknowledge that uh, this is a complex and busy space. You know, carbon confusion is, is totally a thing. There's new carbon companies popping up daily, government, government initiatives, et cetera, et cetera. So, uh, you know, we all feel a bit overwhelmed. I think it's uh, important to, to, to make a start, put a foot on the path, even if the pathway ahead might not necessarily seem clear and things might not seem perfect. So that's the approach that we're, we're adopting with the with the carbon roadmap to assist the sector in, um, in at least making a start. And in this way, the wine sector can, can lead the way in emissions reduction. And, and you could argue that, that we're, we're already leading the way and certainly in, our, in adaptation and, um, and across agriculture, we're, we're also leading the way in emissions reduction. And please reach out to me if you'd, um, if you'd like any further information or if you have any any input um, and sign up to our newsletters if you'd like to uh, keep on top of what's going on in this space. So I think I'll leave it there. Thanks, Marty. Sorry, that was pretty quick. Thank you, Sharon. Uh, now I'd like to introduce Professor Tim Cavanaro. Professor Tim Cavanaro is professor, professor of Soil Ecology and Deputy Head of School and Research in the School of Agriculture, Food and Wine of the University of Adelaide. Tim's research is focused on soil ecological processes with an emphasis on the impacts of land management and environmental change on soil ecosystem services. While Tim works in a range of agricultural systems, vineyard floor management, soil microbiomes and carbon sequestration are major themes in his research. 
Tim, if you're ready to make a start, I'll hand over to you. All right, thank you, Marty. Um, I'm just trying to move things around my screen so they can be seen. Sorry. Okay, excellent. Thank you very much, Marty. Appreciate the, the introduction. And, and also thank you to um, Sharon for a fantastic introduction to really set the stage for what I'm going to um, talk about now and, and what we'll hear from the rest of the panelists. So my, my task was around the, the carbon cycle in vineyards today. Um, as always, my, my contact details are up there. So please don't hesitate to reach out if you've got any further questions beyond today's session. Um, I always like to start talks with the acknowledgements. So firstly, thank you to the AWRI for the invitation to speak today. Um, thanks also to Wine Australia for funding our research in um, cover cropping and vineyard floor management and soil carbon. Um, the owners and managers of our field sites in the Barossa Langhorn Creek and more recently the Riverland, and also um, members of the team who have been involved in this research, in particular um, Tom Lines, Joe Marks, Chris Penfold, and others as well. So my job for today is really to introduce the benefits of um, sequestering carbon, to introduce the carbon cycle and carbon sequestration as a concept, talk about this idea that soil carbon is, or management of soil carbon is about managing an equilibrium in the soil. I'll then um, talk about a little bit of good news in the context of what you're already doing and what you might want to do down the track, and then touch briefly on some methods to increase and protect soil carbon. I guess another way of putting this is I'm gonna try and cram an entire course in carbon biogeochemistry into a, a sort of a 15 minute presentation, um, but I'll, I'll do my best to, to get to the point. So why might you wanna sequester carbon in your soil? Well, there's a number of different reasons. Firstly, soil carbon is really the glue that holds the soil together. Those carbohydrates, root exudates, all these compounds that contain carbon are quite sticky and they help hold the soil particles together. And so that's very important from the perspective of improving and maintaining the structure of your soil. So when you pick up a handful of soil and you crumble it in your hands and you feel those aggregates, those aggregates are really soil particles being held together by soil carbon. That in turn has an impact on the dynamics and the flow of water through your soil. So water infiltration can be improved with improved soil structure. You can also, as you stabilize your soil, reduce the risk of erosion. And there's also a key component of soil fertility that's linked into managing soil carbon as well. And broadly, this all falls under this banner of what people call soil health. And so building carbon in the soil helps maintain and enhance the, the health um, of your soil. The other key benefit of carbon in the soil is that it's the food for the soil biota. So all of those microorganisms and arthropods and invertebrates that live in your soil are really consuming that carbon. It's their food source. So for them to do the work that you want them to do, such as nutrient cycling and so on, it's really important that we have them being fed with that carbon. The image on the right hand side here shows two soil aggregates. The one from the top was from an organically managed plot that had a much higher soil carbon concentration and content than the aggregate in the lower photograph, which was from a conventionally managed plot in an adjacent field. And so the point that I'm trying to show here is that building that carbon in your soil has a really big impact on the structure and the nature of those soil aggregates and it reduces their risk of being broken down, for example, through erosive processes. If we think about sequestering carbon in the vineyard, we also want to think about the vegetation. So by increasing the um, vegetation in your vineyard, you can improve the biodiversity both above ground and below ground. So for example, you can um, increase the diversity of microbes in your soil, and we've shown that in some of our work as have others. Having um, plants present and more diverse plantings can increase the um, habitat for insects, so refugia for beneficial insects. Having vegetation can also reduce the risk of erosion, but there's also the amenity value as well of having um, cover and, and more diversity in your planting systems. There's also business arguments to talk about carbon in the vineyard, and there's been a huge amount of interest in this in the media and e even in just the last couple of days. And so Sharon mentioned before the, the concept of social license. Consumers are increasingly demanding carbon neutral or even carbon negative products. 
And so I think sequestering carbon and achieving carbon neutrality is going to be a, a key aspect of market access for some segments of the market. There's also potential payments um, by selling your carbon credits as well, and I'll, I'll come back to that in a moment. So I think before we get into any further into this, it's worth thinking about what is carbon. So carbon, I'm sure most of you remember high school chemistry and being horrified by the periodic table and all of that information there. But if we think about carbon, it's the sixth element, has a mass of 12. It's a really fundamental element in many of the building blocks of life. And so when I think about carbon, it's not what is carbon, but where is the carbon? And it's really around the forms of carbon that we should be interested in. So if I think of carbon containing compounds, we've got the carbon in carbon dioxide. We've got the carbon in glucose. We've got the carbon that might be in the biomass of organisms and the waste products that they produce. We've got the carbon that's in the microbial biomass. We've got the carbon that's in the plants. So that can be sugars, but it can also be more complex sugars like um, things like cellulose and lignin. Um, we can take that a further step and the, the graphite in your graphite pencil is carbon. It's just rings of carbon that are surrounded by wood, which is cellulose and lignin. The point is that the carbon is always carbon. It's present in different compounds. And if we take that to the sort of the silly extreme, the carbon in a diamond, it's still carbon. It's just being found in different structures and different molecules. And of course, those different forms of carbon or those different carbon containing compounds um, differ in their form, but also their rate of decomposition and their behavior in the environment. So when we talk about sequestering carbon in the soil, it's not only about getting more carbon into the soil, but it's getting it into more and more stable forms. So moving from perhaps simple sugars through to things like cellulose and lignin, which are more stable in the soil environment. So when we then think about carbon and its behavior in the environment, we start to talk about what we call the carbon cycle. And so if we think about a, a soil environment, here we've got the organic carbon pool and the inorganic carbon pool. And so I'm gonna focus on the organic carbon today rather than the inorganic story. We've got carbon dioxide in the atmosphere and through the process of photosynthesis, the vines, and in this case, the cover crop can capture that carbon dioxide and assimilate it into their biomass. And then of course, the leaves and the stems and the roots can all fall off those plants and form the leaf litter or the, the litter component in the soil. And that can make its way into the soil organic matter. We can think about more woody biomass, for example, the prunings that might be retained in the vineyard. And so they can also be a potential source of carbon uh, or biomass. It's important not to forget the, the lower half of the plant, about half of the plant's biomass is below ground. And so there's the litter from the roots, but there's also the root exudates. Roots pump a lot of sugars out into the soil, into the rhizosphere. And all of this together can form this soil organic matter pool. You can also bring in carbon from external sources. So for example, composts or mulches or biochar as well. So these can all be added into the soil. And when all of these different carbon sources in the soil, the microbial biomass can start to go to work on them and they can start to decompose that organic material. And through that decomposition process, they can help stabilize and sequester that carbon and protect that carbon in the soil environment. And so we're moving carbon from the atmosphere through the plants into the soil organic matter pool through the microbial biomass and then into more stable forms in the soil. Of course, as the microbes are busily doing all of this work, they're also respiring and they're releasing some carbon dioxide back out into the atmosphere as well. And so what we really need to do is to tip the balance towards retaining carbon rather than losing carbon. So I guess if I was to summarize the carbon cycle, it's really about carbon cycling through the atmosphere, the plants, the microbes, and the soil. And what we want to do to sequester carbon is tip that balance to, towards building up more carbon in the soil. So what we want to do is increase the carbon inputs and minimize the carbon losses, and then we'll get that net increase or potentially get that net increase in carbon in the soil. So that's really what we're talking about when we talk about carbon sequestration. Okay, so carbon sequestration is simply the process of capturing and storing atmospheric um, carbon dioxide. 
People often talk about carbon neutrality, which is a slightly different thing. This is where the net emissions of a given system are zero. So you might think of this at the vineyard scale or at the, the, the entire enterprise, which might be vineyards and winery scale. And so the offsets from one activity need to be uh, um, off, sorry, the emissions from one activity need to be offset by another activity. So you can offset those emissions yourself, for example, by um, sequestering carbon in your soil, or you can purchase potentially um, carbon credits to offset those emissions. So the good news is you're already in the business of capturing carbon. If you're growing vines and you're growing plants, you are capturing carbon and adding it into your soil environment. So that's, you're already in that, that sort of activity. It's about developing that further. The, perhaps the, the less good news is you can't sell your carbon twice. And I think this is a really important point that is often misunderstood out there. So I, I, I do like to make this one. If you sequester carbon in your soil and you use that as an offset against another activity, you can't then sell that same carbon onto someone else to offset their activities. So if you're claiming the carbon that you sequester towards your carbon neutrality, you can't sell it on for um, payments to someone else. So you can't double account for that carbon. Okay, so if we're building carbon in the soil, it's important to remember that carbon levels in the soil are something of an equilibrium. And so on this figure here on the x-axis, I've got time in decades, and on the y-axis, I've got the soil carbon stocks in tons per hectare. And in a natural ecosystem, we reach something of an equilibrium where the inputs and outputs balance out and we reach this level of equilibrium. Now we can come along and we can disturb our soil and that will reduce the amount of carbon that's retained within the soil. And so that might be physical disturbance in a transition towards agriculture. And we end up with a disturbed ecosystem with a new equilibrium. We might then decide to undertake some sort of carbon sequestration activity to build up the carbon in our soil. And we can start to shift towards a new equilibrium where the carbon stocks in our soils are higher. So we've got this new equilibrium where we've got this restoration. Of course, the point that's really important is you need to maintain those management practices because if you re-disturb your system, you might get a decline in the carbon again. So we've restored it, we've disturbed it, and we're changing our equilibrium. The real question is how far can we push this towards um, a, a steady state at a highest possible level? So the question is how can we sequester carbon in our vineyards? So the, the example I'll use here, and I've spoken about this in many different fora, is around um, vineyard floor management. So here we've got a vineyard, we've got an ecosystem on one side where we've got, uh, in this case, an undervine cover crop. So we've got a planting here, and then we've got a monoculture on the other side where we've just got the vines. And so if we're thinking about sequestering carbon, we need to maximize our carbon inputs, which obviously having the plants here will do that, and minimize the physical disturbance of our soil, so reducing the disturbance of that soil. If we're thinking about carbon neutrality and not just carbon sequestration, it's also important to remember that there are potentially avoided emissions when you go for this kind of management practice where you've got some cover here compared to the monoculture practice where you're having to drive through and use herbicides and use fuel to maintain this bare strip. So there's sort of two sides of the equation here. Um, just to present some data on this, um, this is work that was done by Joe Marks. So he's a, a Wine Australia funded PhD student. He's been looking at um, undervine cover cropping trials. And after about six years, we're seeing an increase in soil carbon stocks in a significant increase in one of our sites on the right-hand side. And the, the side on the left-hand side, we've got that same trajectory that as we move from a herbicide bare earth treatment and we move towards a cover crop, we're increasing our carbon stocks. So that's the tons of carbon in the top 30 centimeters per hectare. So it's relatively quick um, for, a, for an agricultural system. The other side of this, of course, is the activity of the microbes. So the microbes are busily respiring and they're releasing carbon as well. And so what we found is there's greater microbial activity in the soils where we've got the cover crops present compared to where we have the mulch, compared to where we have the herbicide. But even though we've got more CO2 through respiration being released, it's a relatively small amount. And overall, we get an increase in the carbon stock, which is what you need to measure in terms of sequestration. So the take home here is really about maximizing those inputs, maximizing plant cover to build up that carbon in the system. Okay, so how can we build soil carbon more generally? So maintaining and enhancing plant cover, 
that's a really important way because those plants are photosynthesizing, they're capturing that carbon and it's moving into the litter biomass and it can then be stabilized in, in the soil environment potentially. We wanna minimize our physical disturbance of the soil because when you break up the soil, it exposes new sites to oxidation and it takes protected carbon and releases it, makes it more available to being decomposed and losses carbon dioxide. There's also the fuel use associated with using um, machinery. Um, it's important to remember that you can add carbon to your soil, for example, with composts or biochar or mulch, but it's important to remember that if you're moving the biomass or say the compost from one location to your location, that's not sequestration of new carbon. That carbon has already been sequestered when the compost has been made. So it's important to remember how these things are, are, are accounted for. Uh, I think um, Professor White will touch on this later as well. Um, there's also the point that moving materials around the landscape uses fuel as well. So as I always say with biochar, if you're going to make it and add it to your soil, it's important that you move it as little as possible. Making it on one side of the state and trucking it to the other side of the state undoes all that good with sequestering and stabilizing that carbon. So it's important to remember the transportation um, costs as well. Um, baselines, and Sharon said this as well, it's really important to know where you are and where you want to head. So it's important to get a, a baseline understanding of the carbon stocks in your soil. And the way that I think about the sequestration of carbon in a soil is it's, it's much more, it's about much more than just trying to get a, a payment from the federal government for carbon sequestration. It's more about an entire philosophy. So it's thinking about what's the role of carbon in my farming system or my system, and then how do I manage it and maximize the benefits that I receive through improved water infiltration, improved soil health, biodiversity, and so on. It's not just about payments from the ERF. Of course, it's a, it's a massive balancing act, as, as you all know better than I do, managing a vineyard or a, an enterprise. And so it's really important to think about the carbon in the context of your broader business enterprise. So a couple of quick take home messages. Um, there are a lot of reasons to sequester carbon in the soil, not just payments alone. Soil is not a bottomless pit for carbon. Okay, so there's been a lot of, in fact, this morning, there's been a lot of speculation and discussion in the media about how much carbon can be sequestered in Australia's soils. It's not a bottomless pit, in my opinion. Um, management can increase carbon by maximizing your inputs. So that can be cover or composts and so on. But remember the transportation angle around the composts, um, minimizing physical disturbance of the soil and maintaining and enhancing soil biological activity. And overall management can increase soil carbon to a new equilibrium point, but you need to maintain that equilibrium. It's not a set and forget activity. You need to maintain that. And that's why I like to think of carbon sequestration as a, a whole of enterprise philosophy. Okay, so that's um, all I had to say. I'll, I'll finish up here and I guess I'll take any questions at the end. Thank you. Thank you, Tim. Uh, just a reminder for everybody, if you've got questions for either Tim or Sharon, feel free to send those through the Q&A button uh, on your toolbar. Now I'd like to introduce Professor Robert White. Professor Robert White is Emeritus Professor of Soil Science at the University of Melbourne, where he held the Chair of Soil Science from 1994 to 2003. Previously, he was Professor of Soil Science and Director of the Fertiliser and Lime Research Centre at Massey University in New Zealand. He has extensive experience in soil science nationally and internationally and worked at the CSIRO, various universities, and as a private consultant in the viticulture industry from 2004. He has experience, uh, sorry, his experiences in soil, water, and nutrient management in places as diverse as Australia, USA, the UK, New Zealand, China, and Southern Africa, where he's led national and international research teams. Bob has received several awards for his research and has authored a number of books on soil science. Bob, if you're ready to make a start, I'll hand it over to you. Uh, thank you very much, Marty. I'll just have to uh, get my screen shared.
You okay there, Bob? Well, I'm just um, trying to look at uh, my screen to tell you the truth. Um, so you found the share screen button? Well, I, I, know, I know where it is. It's just when I have the have this on uh, slideshow, I can't see this screen button. Um, Let's take it off um, presentation view for a minute. Yeah. And then share. Take the, uh, well. Just escape, to, Bob. Oh, hang on, hang on. I found it. I found it. I believe. Um, Okay, I think I'm on my way now. Is that coming through? Is that, com is that yes. coming through? Yes, just pop it into presenter view. Okay, here we go. Are we, are we okay now? Not yet, just pop it into presenter view. Yeah. There you go, you're good. All, all set? Go ahead. Oh, thank you, Marty, and uh, thank you to uh, AWRI. I'm sorry for the hiccup there. And also thank you to Tim for a very comprehensive introduction to this whole business of carbon cycling in vineyards. Now, um, it's carbon sequestration in vineyards is being promoted in Australia and in, in the United States as a means of offsetting greenhouse gas emissions. I think we're well aware of that now. Uh, in Australia, it's all managed under the Emissions Reduction Fund, which is a government run organization. And vineyards are included under perennial woody horticulture. Now, to qualify for an ERF project, vineyards must implement a change in management practice. It's not sufficient to just be growing vines, because if you've got an established vineyard and it's uh, growing away there, that is regarded as business as usual. And you've got to do something additional to um, sequester additional carbon other than that which you are doing under your normal practice. And I'll just toss in this uh, slide here, which I borrowed from a friend because it um, covers some of the points which Tim has covered very well. Um, you can start off uh, down uh, here with a very uh, low, um, low carbon content in the soil. And if you change the management practice in some way or other, you can actually build up soil carbon to an, a new equilibrium. The equilibrium position for the soil as it exists at the present time under current management is shown by this line here. So it's in equilibrium with its environment and the uh, inputs and outputs of carbon are balanced. But if you do something to change the management by adding compost or something like that, or growing a cover crop, you can get it to increase the soil carbon to a new equilibrium. But as Tim said, if you don't maintain that practice, then uh, you can find that the carbon content will decline over time. So this is a, a very important uh, aspect of this whole business of sequestration. Well, wow, what's happened here? Now, here's an example 
of um, soil carbon measurements in Napa and Sonoma counties in the United States over a period of um, 13 years or so. And you can see that there's been virtually no change in the average soil carbon in this whole collection of vineyards over 40, 400, I should say, measurements over time. And uh, it's clear that the management system in these vineyards is something which is um, just maintaining the soil carbon, but neither increasing it nor decreasing it. And there are um, good reasons for this. Uh, under the current situation with the Emissions Reduction Fund, cover cropping and manure and compost additions are not eligible activities in vineyard. Uh, these uh, compost and manure we refer to as non-synthetic fertilizers. Uh, the other point is that uh, there's a baseline period which extends back for 10 years, which says that uh, if you're going to adopt a new practice, you should not have been doing that for the previous 10 years. So if you're deciding to grow a cover crop, for example, you should, you should be doing it in a vineyard where it hasn't been done for a previous 10 years. That's the current situation. The contracts which are entered into are with the Australian government, and there's a market for what are called Australian Carbon Credit Union units. But uh, most of these units are bought by the Australian government at a a fixed price, which is determined in a reverse auction, uh, only about 10% are sold on the voluntary market where it's possible to get a higher price. And uh, one of these uh, uh, car carbon credit units is equivalent to one tonne of carbon dioxide equivalent, which has been sequestered or avoided in the vineyard. Now, as I said at the beginning, there's American schemes as well. Uh, and some of these American operators have been uh, selling or buying units here in Australia. These are all private companies. It's not a government scheme. Uh, the vineyards activities are eligible under most of these schemes, but the requirements for additionality, that is, carrying out a, a, a new practice are rather lax. Uh, the the uh, re measurements of, of or the allowance for leakage uh, are lax and permanence is very variable. In some year, cases, it can be as little as uh, three years. Uh, measuring is um, not taken particularly seriously. Uh, not to the same extent as it is here in Australia. And the allowance for um, loss of carbon at some stage during the, the period of the contract is pretty weak. The, all their carbon credits are sold on the voluntary market. There's no government market. But one should be aware that if Australian growers participate in these schemes, those credits that they may earn do not account count against the Australian greenhouse gas inventory. They'll be attributed to uh, some inventory in the United States. So let's look at uh, what some of the constraints and the opportunities are at the present time. Now, the soil carbon farming method is under revision at the present time. There's a dra draft 2021 method, which has been circulated. And one of the things in that is that they're going to reduce the ba baseline period to five years instead of 10, which will be good. Uh, they're also going to allow cover cropping and the use of non synthetic fertilizers. However, they put a restriction on the amount of this NSF, which can be applied, to be less than 
100 kilograms of carbon per hectare per year, which if one's considering manure or compost or biochar, this is a very small amount. However, the exception is that that um, material, the NSF, can be derived within the carbon estimation area or produced from a designated waste stream. Now, the same arguments apply to biochar. It has, however, it has to be made by a state approved process. And the carbon applied in the biochar must be deducted from any measured increase in soil carbon. This is even if that biochar is derived from material which is produced in the carbon estimation area. So this is a bit of an anomaly in the scheme at the present time, which um, one is trying to get clarification on. But one of the, one of the real uh, realities for carbon sequestration in vineyards, well, based on trial and commercial data from vineyards, it's difficult to achieve significant increases in carbon storage and they are generally slow. Uh, the best options seem to be minimizing tillage, growing a cover crop and composted prunings from the vineyard itself. And let me give you some examples. Uh, this is uh, some work which was done in France, the Loire Valley. And there was a 28 year experiment there in which they uh, used uh, crushed prunings as an application on an annual basis. They used 10 tons of cow manure, eight tons of mushroom compost, and then doubled those amounts of cow manure and compost. And this soil obviously had a low organic carbon content to start with, but um, when one looked at the increase in carbon storage, and this is in terms of megagrams or tons per hectare to three meter depth, you had um, relatively small increases unless you were adding very large amounts of manure and, and compost. And uh, in terms of a carbon offset, in terms of tons of carbon dioxide equivalent per hectare per year, uh, the only system where, where you could uh, use it yourself, unless you were able to produce a lot of cow manure and mushroom compost around the vineyard, um, was uh, of the order of one ton of carbon dioxide equivalent per hectare per year, which is quite small. Um, if we look at uh, measurements of soil carbon in vineyards, these are commercial vineyards now, where they've been monitoring soil carbon, an example from the Yarra Valley in Victoria. And in one case here, Pinot Noir over a 10 year period or so, was showing a slight increase in carbon over time. Whereas a Chardonnay, which was being managed under virtually the same conditions, same soil, same rainfall and so on, was showing a slight decrease. And we really don't know the reasons for these uh, changes, but they're not very big changes, either increasing or decreasing. And uh, th this vineyard here, you can see, had a cover crop which were extended right into the vine row. So it was an optimal performance as far as the cover crop was concerned. Uh, this is an example from the Tamuna Vineyard in Martinborough, New Zealand. And again, this was a very well managed vineyard. It had uh, a volunteer cover crop growing, which was raised by sheep during the winter time. Uh, various fertilizers uh, were added according to the soil testing. And you can see that um, the, the block one Pinot Noir was showing very little change in carbon content over time. Uh, block two, Sauvignon Blanc was showing perhaps a slight increase. And this gives you an idea of the soil. It was a very gravelly soil. Uh, so um, the uh, amount of carbon you can store there, of course, is, 
is limited because the, the uh, gravel constitutes about 40 to 50% of the soil volume. Uh, so these are these are, are real world examples of uh, what's happening to soil carbon uh, in uh, commercial vineyards, which are doing um, good practice as far as management is concerned. You can also notice the variation that you can get in soil carbon over time. So this is one of the problems with measuring soil carbon is spatially and temporally it's variable. So let's look at some of the requirements if one's going to get involved with the ERF. The minimum contract period is 25 years. And for that period, there's a 25% discount in any carbon credits that you earn. There must be an additional cover crop. And in the case of vineyard, sorry, additional activity in the case of vineyard, that's uh, most probably a growing a cover crop now. Uh, the change in carbon is based on soil measurements because there are no models of soil carbon dynamics which can be used in vineyard soils. There are these models which are available in cropping systems, but not to my knowledge in vineyards. The measurement must be to at least 30 centimetres depth. And in the project management, there have to be three audits carried out over the 25 year period. So those audits all cost money. So the conclusion is that growers should do a cost benefit analysis before deciding to engage in the ERF to earn carbon credits. And we find that the value of an ACCU is low. It's about $17 at the present time per tonne of carbon dioxide uh, equivalent sequestered. But in the voluntary market, it, this could be increasing. Uh, a most recent price in the, for carbon credits in the voluntary market is about $29 per ACCU. Uh, and uh, there's, it's forecast that as more and more uh, businesses want to offset their own emissions because they can't reduce them far enough, they will be looking to buy carbon credits from the agricultural sector. And uh, so this could mean that the voluntary market could expand quite significantly. Currently, the govern government purchase of ACCUs is dominant. The other thing that needs to be taken into account is the cost of sampling and analysis uh, for carbon. Uh, this is quite an expensive business, but it's possible that with new technology, sensor technology calibrated against soil carbon measurements, that this could come down, but probably nowhere near what the government suggests it could be as low as $3 per hectare. That's or virtually unattainable at the present time. And the other th thing is that it's a complex business getting involved in the ERF the project so that most um, producers, growers, farmers will, will engage a facilitator to manage that project and uh, arrange the auditing. And most of these facilitators charge about one third of the value of a carbon credit to manage the project. So the conclusion is, <clears throat> and this, uh, this came up in Tim's talk as well, is that there's, uh, the important thing is to recognize that there, there are many other benefits to increasing soil carbon. And the prime one is improving soil health because of the various things he listed enhanced biological activity, et cetera, cation exchange, nutrient storage, improved structure and increased availability in water in sandy soils. But I would point out that there's a bit of a paradox here in that from the point of view of enhanced biological activity and carbon turnover, which is one of the aspects of a healthy soil, 
you're, you're looking for rapid turnover of carbon, rapid decomposition, conversion to other microbial products. Whereas in sequestration, you're interested in converting carbon into a very stable compound in the soil. Uh, an inert, stabilized carbon, which is going to stay there for a long time. So there is this paradox between the requirements for improved soil health and the requirements for uh, sequestering carbon to earn carbon credits. And then this was also touched on in, in Sharon's talk, where uh, Vineron should realize that it's good marketing to demonstrate that their businesses are carbon neutral. And this can be done without entering into a project with the ERF, can be done through these uh, companies such as Toy2 EnviroCare in New Zealand, which will do a complete carbon analysis, inputs and outputs, and, and so on for the business. And the other point which was mentioned is if ACCUs, which are earned under the ERF, are sold off, these credits can't be counted against the business. They've been sold, therefore they're no, they no longer belong to you or your business. Now, the federal government may decide under its new pathway to 2050 to decide to pay growers and farmers for storing carbon in the soil. Currently, they're, they're paying through the ERF, but maybe they're going to just pay for um, anybody who can demonstrate that they have stored or are storing carbon in the soil. That the, uh, but th there's a lot of hype about this. The figures suggesting that we could sequester 250 million tonnes of carbon dioxide equivalent per year with uh, a full-blown carbon sequestration scheme. Now, this, this is uh, pie in the sky, really. The current Australian emissions are 529 million tonnes of carbon dioxide equivalent per year. And they're suggesting that uh, half of that could be sequestered on an annual basis by storing carbon in the soil. But that is a very, very remote possibility. And so I'll leave it there. <clears throat> Thank you, Bob. Now I'd like to introduce Ollie Madgett. Ollie Madgett became a grower in McLaren Vale in 2015 after having previously co-funded We Are Interactive, an award-winning social games company based in London in the UK. He runs the Adelaide Ag Tech Meetup, which brings together a community of more than 700 developers, farmers and entrepreneurs interested in the agricultural technology space. He also serves on the AgriFutures Australia Ignite Advisory Panel. Ollie is one of the founders of Platform, a startup that helps grape growers to carry out work on their land with precision, simply using their mobile phone or tablet. So Ollie, if you're ready to start, I'll hand it over to you. Fantastic, thank you so much, Marty. Um, I will just uh, quickly whip through this. So no, thank you, Marty. So um, yeah, I'm a, a grower in McLaren Vale. Um, and one of the things that we did this year was to get certified under the SWA scheme. And actually, as a part of that, one of the things that we wanted to do on our vineyard was to actually rigorously baseline what our soil carbon is currently, um, not to kind of lodge it under the ERF scheme, although we did follow that, that generally that process, but just so we had a proper understanding of it and we could track things over time. So um, we worked with, um, so we're in McLaren Vale, so um, we actually did our coring. This is integrated precision viticulture, George Dryden. So he did the coring for us. And we had Ed Scott at um, um, the soil and carbon, uh, the soil and land company as our soil scientist. And Rebecca Tompkin also helped us, who was a part of the land care group here. So again, we followed broadly the method. So that involved us dividing up our vineyard. Uh, we decided to divide it up into 
um, four different sampling strata. The minimum required is three. And then in each of those sampling strata, um, we dropped in uh, six different spots where we took soil cores. Um, and again, probably best practice is to actually, you know, if you're going to be submitting something to the ERF, probably, uh, well, I believe it's at least kind of eight to 10 cores per strata to get, uh, you know, a much more rigorous understanding of the variability within that piece of land. So yeah, we, we divided that up. Um, the way that we stratified our vineyard was based on, on changes to our soil. So when we took over this vineyard, we had it EM38 mapped. So we knew where those changes were coming and we just used platform to basically divide it up, randomly drop some sample points onto the vineyard and then, and then George drove to those spots before he took the cores. Um, but actually, you know, going through that process, like we, we stratified our land um, based on, on our soil types, but actually, you know, one of our learnings from going through that process was, you know, as grape growers, um, one of the most natural ways to divide up our vineyards is actually to, to, to zone them into kind of mid row sections and undervine sections. And as the, everybody who's spoken before has kind of mentioned, you know, we have a whole different set of practices that we can do in that mid row region compared to that undervine region. And obviously also the undervine region, if we've got drip irrigation receives a lot more water. So inherently like they're, they're, they're spatially um, potentially different. So one of the things actually we did with Sharon and Horticulture Innovation Australia off the back of baselining the vineyard was to um, liaise with the clean energy regulator and make a recommendation that under the 21 methodology that we're able to stratify vineyards um, you know, and I think they call it permanent alley crops slightly differently. And if, as and when the current draft methodology comes into practice, which I believe could be, you know, any time over the next month or so, um, you'll be able to divide your vineyards up into those into those areas. There is a kind of a clause that you've got to have a minimum of three areas. So probably, like grape growers, will end up practically dividing the vineyard in half, and then. Um, within each of those halves, then subdividing that again into kind of that undervine area or mid row area, you know, and people might choose to to subdivide it even further. But that's a good step forwards for our for our industry that that um, the 21 methodology is going to be a lot more more appropriate there as well. Um, and again, just really quickly to touch on some of the things that we did, um, we took our soil cores using a, um, a 38 millimeter. Um, uh, soil corer so that's the minimum that's required under the current methodology uh, we then so what we did was we actually we 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 um, had a one meter long tube uh, we banged in three we took 30 centimeter soil cores which again is the minimum required under the current methodology and we put a little piece of sponge after we'd done every every 30 centimeters so that when we got back to the headland and actually opened up those cores, we could find those bits of sponge and use that to kind of divide out each of the samples. Um, there's four or five um, labs that I know of in Australia that, that do you know, CFI tests, which is the carbon farming um, tests. We used APAL labs. So basically um, each, of our, each of our sample points had its own test done on it. You can, you can kind of mush in um, test together, but we felt it was important to keep each one of them separate. So again, APAL Labs has a really good little app called Farm to Lab, which helps you to keep a track of all of your soil samples. And, you know, that's what we're using to keep a record of, you know, of where our starting point was. So this is where we were on our vineyard. So um, we're on a, a kind of black, we're on quite reasonably heavy clay soils. Um, our um, total organic carbon number came out about one and a half percent, which I believe is about average from a Vale. We did have a load of sampling challenges with the other part of the um, calculation for your for your soil carbon stock, which is your bulk density. Really, all of those numbers should have been above um, above one, and you'll see quite a few of them are slightly below that. So that's probably ever so slightly pulled down how much we've got as a starting amount of. Um, tons of soil carbon per hectare so we came out as an average of about 47 tons a hectare um, and as 
everybody said before, you know, realistically, we're only six and a half hectares. So if we could increase soil carbon across our vineyard by, you know, a couple of tons a year, that would be a significant achievement. So again, echo everything that has just been said about, um, you know, this is this is a, a slow, generally a slower process to build. But we, you know, we're in play now. We've, we we understand our base numbers. Um, I just wanted to share a couple of tools that we used, which might be helpful to people. Syro has a really helpful tool called look-c.farm. And that's a really nice little web tool where you can draw around your vineyard and it will return back to you what they estimate your current soil carbon levels being um, based on all of the soil sample data that exists um, in, in the kind of Syro Australian system at the moment. So, and again, for our vineyard, that was actually really, really close. It predicted about one and a half percent soil carbon as well. And, you know, there's lots of innovation happening with that tool over the coming years as well. Um, and just in terms of like, what, what are we doing? So we're, we're again, we're not um, on our vineyard in our situation, because we haven't lodged this with the clean energy regulator. Um, we aren't trying to kind of constrain our management options around what is or isn't allowed. But one of the things that we've done is we worked with Leask Agri, who are a contractor in McLaren Vale, to and um, Pete Soils and Jeffrey's Compost. Like we've been banding compost um, under Vine for the last few seasons, but this year we had a go at trying to incorporate it into our soils. So we got granulated compost and gypsum um, and actually a little bit of biochar in uh, as well that was granulated and put it into a single super spreader uh, ripper and actually ripped it into our soils to see if that can help it to obviously um, cycle more slowly. So again, uh, we're learning lots of lessons as we go. Uh, definitely, it really highlighted the need for us and contractors in our region to have um, you know, rippers that can apply granulated products at a much higher rate than we were achieving. So we really needed to rip you know, like a ton of that granulated product in a hectare, and we were really struggling to get to that rate. So definitely feel like there's a requirement for machinery that's very specifically focused at, at helping us to improve soil carbon. Um, one of the other things that we did this winter was to start cell grazing our sheep so normally we've just let them roam across the whole vineyard, but but this year we basically constrain them to um, less than a hectare at a time and move them around to each new zone, zone every couple of weeks. Um, that led to some, my poor fencing, suddenly putting them under a bit of grazing pressure, suddenly made them want to escape. So that was interesting when they went into next year's next door's vineyard. Uh, but, but again, um, hopefully starting to take some of those learnings from the livestock industry in terms of cell grazing and bringing it through into viticulture seeing lots of innovation you know being led by people like um tim and the team at adelaide uni um around you know seeding different crops under vine and you know innovation happening around things like hydro seeding as well so you know where you see kind of seeds sprayed out with that green film on roadsides actually using to kind of looking to adopt those same practices to get specific seeds planted under vines in vineyards um also we went out to gippsland to see the soil key renovator in action so this is um basically a um it's planting a multi-species um multi-species cover crops um it's primarily being used in in livestock and dairy to date um it's achieved some really good results again in in increasing soil carbon in, in that part of the world and it will be really interesting to see, hopefully, a, um, uh, a, a thinner version of that, being able to kind of um, work within the, you know, three meter row widths of, of vineyards. So, yeah, innovation there. Um, so, yeah, lots and lots and lots is happening. Um, just in parallel, as Marty said at the beginning, um, I, I do come from more of a kind of a, um, a technology background. So we've been working to try and help this space as well from both our ag tech community perspective and also from platform so we've been doing some some work um very openly across the whole wine industry to try and look at standardizing mapping so looking at how we we survey vineyards in a consistent way and map vineyards in a consistent way um this is actually um uh aerial mapping of our vineyard being done with a drone but we've also tested out and trialed mapping it 
using a, a, a tablet, um, just an ordinary Android tablet. Um, and again, one of the teams are off surveying vineyards in Tasmania just today. Um, and again, that's about building up really accurate base maps of vineyards. And the reason why that is important is that we're creating a, a structure to really, really accurately position where those soil samples are taken. So, which again will help us as an industry to meet the requirements of the energy reduction fund. Um, but also um, it's creating the data structure so that we, we know at a specific point along a vine row or a point along the mid row, what the soil carbon um, numbers were at, at the initial point in time. And then we can start actually recording the work that was carried out on those vineyards against the same features. So we can both take a starting point, we can record you know, what um, mulch or compost might have been banded out under the vine or where we might have ripped certain inputs in, into the mid rows or gray sheep. And but it's, it's building up this picture with data of what we've actually done so that when it comes to rebase lining, we have the structure that will allow us as an industry to start to uncover what activities are actually leading to increases in soil carbon so we feel this is a you know a really important step to to make and and we're out there kind of helping to put that in place so um you know if um we've kind of been learning lots of the lessons um the hard way out there and and, and in pushing in this space so um yeah happy to share any of the learnings from our side or to assist anybody on the call that's looking to baseline their, their vineyard. Um, again, I think it will be much more relevant to viticulture when that 2021 methodology comes into effect. But, you know, that is likely to be just months away. Uh, and again, um, you know, just from our perspective as a, as a grape grower, like we're, we're very small, so it doesn't make commercial sense for us to look to be selling carbon credits. But, you know, we supply to Treasury, who also have a um, carbon neutrality commitment. So I'm interested from my personal perspective about potentially insetting any gains that we can create into our supply chain. Um, also, lots of innovation happening in kind of the finance sector, where there's going to be sustainability linked um, uh, financing coming through. So it just feels really important over the next couple of years to get ourselves basically lodged into the system. So I don't want to commit myself to selling carbon credits at any rate or any of the permanence obligations at this stage. But unless you get yourself into the system and get lodged, you kind of don't exist and you can't benefit from any of the offs, um, upsides in the future. So again, personally, it, it, it's feeling like, you know, putting a deposit in a bank. So, um, you know, and, and hoping that over time and expecting over time to have options with what will happen in the future. So that's our perspective. Thank you so much, Marty. Thank you, Ollie. And uh, at this point, I want to invite the other speakers to come back on. So turn your cameras on and we'll go to some questions. Um, there's quite a number that have come through the Q&A and then one, there's one that I think we should, probably should talk to before we go to the soil specific questions. And I think I'm gonna throw this one to Tim to start with. The question is, with regards to grapevines themselves, do they sequester carbon and how much CO2 does a vine absorb? Um, thanks, Marty, that, that's a great, yeah. okay. I'm... Sorry, I'm Marty. Right. Yeah, you're right, you're right. Okay. Sorry, that was exciting, wasn't it? Marty and I are sitting side by side in the same room, so there's a bit of an echo there. Um, yeah, no, look, really interesting question. So obviously as plants are photosynthesizing, they're capturing carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and, and fixing it into carbohydrates in the plant. Um, so the, the vines are sequestering carbon, that would be both in their above ground biomass, so their, their leaves and the stems, um, but also the grapes themselves and also into their below ground biomass. Um, typically woody biomass is about 46% carbon. So if you estimate the amount of woody biomass that's produced in a given year and multiply that by 0.46, that would give you a, a rough indication of the, the stock 
of carbon that you would get in that biomass. Um, some of that will then turn over and be lost through respiration. Some of it will make its way into the winery and obviously undergo fermentation and, and some carbon's lost there as well. But yeah, the plants will be sequestering carbon or sorry, capturing carbon and storing it in their biomass. Bob, did you want to also respond? Well, I was just going to say that um, that that's all very good, knowing how much um, carbon dioxide the vines are sequestering. But if we're talking about any offset scheme, then um, growing the vines is just business as usual. So you don't get any credit for that. Now, people might think that that's a pretty poor deal, but that's the way it is. It has to be some additional process which you implement in the vineyard to enable you to store extra carbon, demonstrate that you're storing extra carbon, and then get a credit for it. So that's the way the rules work, not only here in Australia, but in other parts of the world. Thanks for that. Now, Mark Gishon has asked, how deep is the pit for carbon sequestration? So a typical vineyard soil, maybe Tim, Bob, either of you two? Well, um, digging a pit might help you actually understand something about your soil, but it's not going to help very much as far as uh, measuring carbon and uh, getting some credit for it. You, you have to follow various strict procedures in terms of uh, core drilling as, uh, as Ollie showed. And uh, that has to be for a minimum of 30 centimeters. You can go deeper if you want to. And if you measure the carbon in uh, a deeper layer of soil, you can report that and you may get credit for that subsequently if you can show that it has increased over time but uh, the uh, the standard procedure is to take core samples of the soil for carbon measurement thanks for that bob now this is a question for tim how exactly how would you go about doing it? I guess Ollie showed us how he's done it in his vineyard. Is there anything else you can add to that? No, I think Ollie covered the key points there that if you take a regular, if you go out into the, the field and you dig a hole with a shovel and you send it off to a commercial lab and you get the carbon concentration, so that'll be returned as percent carbon. That's not your carbon stock, <laughs> only one half of the equation. Uh, the other key point that Ollie went through was around you need to know the bulk density, which is the mass of soil per unit volume. So it's about taking a careful core, knowing the volume of that core, the depth it was taken to, then working out how that soil was in that core um, and getting the carbon concentration as well. So it's, it's just really important to remember that the soil carbon concentration or the percent carbon is not the same as your soil carbon stock, which is tons of carbon um, in, per hectare in a, a given depth. Could you also comment just on the soil sampling and the analysis and the variability across the results? Ollie showed his variation in results and those couple of graphs that Bob put up also showed something similar. Um, you know, is there a recommendation for the type or the amount of replication you might need to do to get an accurate sample or any comments? Yes, um, yeah, welcome to my world. <laughs> it's how many samples do you need and because you don't want to overdo it in terms of, of effort. So I would say generally most surveys of soils fail to capture enough soil samples. Um, certainly, you know, within any sort of scheme, there'll be regulations around a minimum number of samples that are taken per unit area. Um, you know, from a research perspective, what we typically do is go out and take quite a few samples and then we can work backwards to work out the optimal number of samples. So it's, it's a process called looking at semi-variance. Um, and then from there, you can optimize the number of samples that you take. But within, within schemes, there are set minimum numbers of samples you need to take. But generally, you know, the more the merrier. Bob, did you want to respond as well? Well, I, I just point out that um, under the ERF regulations, you, and Ollie mentioned this, you are allowed to um, stratify your carbon estimation area. 
uh, the minimum number of strata is three, uh, and that within that each strata you you are supposed to take a minimum of three samples, which can be composted. Uh, however, the more samples you take, um, the more expensive it becomes. It can cost you a few thousand dollars per hectare uh, if you want to get the variability down to a, uh, an acceptable value. And under the ERF scheme, there is a penalty for uh, results which are too variable. Uh, there's a discount, in fact, until you, um, you manage to get to the point where you've got uh, fairly consistent results. And the other thing I'd mention is that uh, in calculating a stock, it's very important that you uh, have a measure of the amount of gravel that's there. Now, the example I gave you in uh, New Zealand was a very gravelly soil, so that only about half of that soil is fine earth which can store carbon. The gravel doesn't store carbon. So um, in calculating the bulk density, the, there's a complicated procedure for uh, arriving at the equivalent soil mass if you want to compare measurements over time. And uh, in the case of uh, gravelly soils, this becomes uh, critical uh, to uh, recognize that there's a uh, there's a qu quite a high proportion of gravel there. Yes, Bob. Well, I've got you, Bob. Um, the, another question is around you know, looking at the economic um, viability of going through an ERF methodology. What then could the possibilities be with regards to aggregation? And perhaps once you've answered that, we'll go to Ollie, because I know, Ollie, you've probably thought about this. Uh, you're talking about aggregation of um, vineyards? Yes. Yeah. Well, I think that's certainly possible under the um, ERF methodology. You can um, get together with neighbouring vineyards and um, so you can uh, get a larger area. Uh, you'd have to be careful that um, you weren't combining areas that had uh, very different soil types, for example, uh, and you'd, you'd want to be fairly confident that the um, the mesoclimate for, for the region was uh, reasonably constant for that um, group of vineyards, but it is possible to do that, and, and uh, in that way you can um, you can reduce some of the costs per unit area through um, getting together with other vineyards. Cool, and I guess from my side, Marty. Um, yeah, there's there's obviously loads of innovation happening in this space at the moment there's there's things i think it's called the regen farmers mutual there's like all kinds of different types of cooperative structures that are in development at the moment to allow farmers to um pull together and also pull together with some of the other kind of additional benefits that that basically grape growers can deliver environmentally to try and make things kind of make more sense commercially uh, from from when we've spoken to soil carbon developers previously like just under the current method if you're on your own it's like a hundred a hundred hectares is the kind of the smallest typically um area of land that's kind of gone into an erf project on its own so obviously as i you know like we're six and a half hectares so it just won't make sense for us and even if we were in a um like I'm just trying to put some numbers in context you know if even if we were to like be able to increase our soil carbon by like half a ton a hectare per year and the um accu price ended up at like 40 or 50 dollars like we, we'll we'd struggle to make more than 300 to 400 dollars a year out of soil carbon credits but like if this helps us because we could in, potentially inset this into treasuries um you know this could be a part of treasury claiming becoming carbon neutral as a brand that we supply to if this helps us with our you know working with treasury um then this will that like that's the real benefit for us and and again if this helps and if we ever produce wine under our own brand i think it will be really helpful and again the finance i think there's gonna be lots of additional benefits that's gonna come through 
for people in agriculture, especially from the finance sector, that the, the whole move towards sustainability linked um, financial instruments is going to, um, you know, a tiny percentage of your mortgage rate on a vineyard will make this all make sense. And also as soon as we're able to show that vineyards that are, that are basically lodged or land that is lodged under the ERF that doesn't yet have any obligations of permanence, they haven't kind of like um, retired any carbon credits against them. They're just lodged into the system. Like as soon as that starts to show that an increase in value of land, then that suddenly it all makes sense. So um, yeah, just uh, definitely, as everybody said, I think entering this whole space, expecting to make significant money directly off carbon credits is, is really risky at the moment, um, definitely. Thanks, Ollie. Um, question for you, Bob. This is from Rob Bramley. He asks, there's quite a few examples which strongly suggest that in order to build up soil carbon, one also has to apply other nutrients, for example, nitrogen. Do you think that the relatively low rate of fertilizer inputs in vineyards compared to some other cropping systems is one of the reasons why carbon buildup in vineyards you know, may be so difficult? Well, I think there's uh, a lot of truth to that. I mean, uh, fundamentally to, uh, to grow the plants and you are going to need nitrogen as well as the other major elements. Uh, and usually nitrogen, too much nitrogen is considered to be bad news for um, uh, wine quality or, or uh, promoting excess vigor and, 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 wine, and the quality of the wine produced, particularly red wines. Uh, so this, this could be the explanation for, um, for uh, the fact that it's difficult to build up soil carbon at, a, at an appreciable rate in, um, in most vineyards unless you're on a very uh, fertile soil. Right. And just while we've still got you there, Bob, um, Prue Henschke asked a question about just clarifying what you're talking about when you were talking about cover crops um, and the difference between an annual cover crop that might be cultivated in and a point permanent sward, which we, you were talking about. Yes, well, I was really referring to cover crops, which are permanent cover crops where you're, you're not um, cultivating it in. And it's not really necessary to cultivate um, um, a cover crop into the soil to get mm -hmm. a carbon increase because you get a carbon increase through um, dead root material, root exudates, and also litter falling onto the ground. And if the cover crop is mown, of course, then uh, the mowings can be thrown into the vine row where they will be uh, serve as a mulch. So uh, I was really referring to uh, permanent cover crops, not uh, not annuals or anything like that. Tim, do you want to respond? Yeah, I, I can probably make a comment that's relevant to the the last two questions. So when yeah, when I've talked about cover cropping, it, it's about a permanent sward under vine. Um, so self regenerating, you know, sets its own seed, self regenerates rather than being cultivated and re-sown. Um, getting back to Rob's question too, certainly including nitrogen fixing plants as part of a, a mixture um, in a cover crop can also help provide some of that nitrogen that will then support um, what we're talking about here. So yeah, it's about selection of plant and plant traits as well. Thanks, Tim. Well, I'm not sure who wants to take this one, but uh, Richard Smart's asking around and this is going away from, I guess, directly to from soil, but the use of pyrolysis on waste streams, so things like prunings and grape stalks, pressings, um, so pyrolysis to create electricity and um, also biochar and how that might contribute. Either Tim or Bob? Yeah, well, the, the situation with biochar is a bit anomalous at the present time because um, the amount of carbon that is applied in the biochar has to be deducted from any increase in soil carbon that is measured. Uh, so you don't get credit for the carbon in the biochar, but the addition of the biochar may well uh, benefit the, the soil from the point of view of um, improving the structure or improving the cation exchange capacity, or may even uh, stimulate micro microbial activity, although that's less likely unless it's composted with some 
manure, like chicken manure, because the biochar is by definition very inert carbon. I just, Ollie's got to leave the session. So thank you, Ollie. We'll say goodbye to you now. For, I think. Thanks, Ollie. Thank you, Marty. Thank you, everybody. I'll throw across to Tim. I think he wanted to make a comment on that last one. Yeah, yeah. Just the point around um, biochar is that if you're making it, as I said before, a great distance away from where it's being applied to the soil, it's just important to remember that transportation cost. Um, and I think that's true of any sort of soil amendment that if we're moving at vast different distances, that, that can burn through a lot of energy um, as well. Um, the other thing is we, we do have a, a new project that's just started up a smart farming project in, in collaboration with Vinay Paggy and, and some other people as well, looking at the placement of composts and biochar in a, a newly established vineyard. Um, so we should have some nice um, Australian relevant data coming out in, in the coming years on that topic as well. Yeah, uh, just a just a comment on that. Um, if you if you're transporting material from a distance to bring to a vineyard, that's regarded as a scope three emission, and therefore it doesn't have to be accounted for under the uh, international accounting records. However, uh, it it is perfectly reasonable to say that um, that you are by by transporting the material over a large distance, you are adding to greenhouse gas emissions, but uh, those emissions would be counted under the transport sector and not the um, agricultural sector. And that they may well pass that cost on to you as the purchaser. And they could do. Yeah, just like aircraft carriers or airlines do you can offset yeah got a question for you sharon you talked uh, right at the very beginning about um putting together that roadmap roadmap <coughs> net zero emissions for the wine industry are you looking to other industries to have a look at what they're doing has anyone else put together that roadmap and is it you know are you looking at those and is anyone else doing it really well already uh yes we are marty so um uh, Meat and Livestock Australia have a, a roadmap, CN30, where they're aiming to be uh, net carbon zero by um, 2030. So that's a, that's a really good example to look to. Um, I think the dairy sector also has one. Um, and the others are, are kind of still in development. So there, there are a couple of examples out there. And, and yes, we are, um, we are looking to those for, um, uh, for, for inspiration, I guess, and um, and to see to see what should be included, and just to emphasise that, um, that this will be developed along along with the sector. So um, we'll have have buy-in from the start and produce something that that the sector will um, will embrace and, and go forward with. I think this is one more one last question here, and this one's for you, Bob. Um, oh, I've lost it. It's from Chris Penfold. He asks if prunings were collected and composted, composted like lots of vineyards do do, and then they return that to the vineyard, could that be viewed as a carbon credit? Well, yes, um, because um, if your vineyard was in a carbon estimation area and then you were generating prunings from that vineyard, you could um, chop them up, compost them, do whatever and then reapply in the vineyard, and that, that would be regarded as uh, an acceptable practice. The only problem at the moment I, I see is that um, the, the way the regulations are written, um, any such um, addition of um, organic material, a non-synthetic fertilizer, uh, the carbon in that material has to be deducted from the increase in soil carbon that you may measure. So um, the, 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 I think the, the thinking behind this is that in returning uh, composted prunings to the soil in the vineyard, it's um, supposed to increase the rate of carbon accumulation in the soil itself. And so you, you don't get credit for the carbon that's uh, in the prunings themselves. 
which is, I think, is a bit anomalous. All right, I'm going to close it, uh, draw it to a close now. But thank you very much, Tim, Sharon, Bob, and Ollie, um, for giving us your lending us your expertise, providing those insights into offsetting greenhouse gas emissions by sequestering carbon in vineyard soils. Um, I'm sure everybody listening in today got a lot out of this session. I certainly did. Um, and I guess, of course, I'd like to um, also acknowledge and thank all the audience for coming along today and taking part. And just to remind you that you will receive a link to the webinar if you'd like to watch it back. And I'd also encourage you, if you've got other questions, contact the speakers directly. Um, you, you find all of their contact details on their slides. Um, the next AWRI webinar is on seasonal client outlook for summer 21-22, which is being held on the 11th of November. If you'd like to register for that session, um, please visit the AWRI website and register there. So thank you all again, and I look forward to seeing you at the next AWRI webinar.